Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're dialing in from, and welcome to this FIP webinar uh, on part of our FIP Transforming Vaccination Globally and Regionally program. And this is the third part of our, of our program focusing on regional needs and drivers for transforming vaccination. And today's event in particular is focusing on the Western Pacific region. Um, I will now hand over to uh, Dr. John Jackson for uh, the, the, one of the co-moderators of, of today's event for the introduction. John. Thank you very much, Gonzo. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you to those joining us live and also to those who listen in afterwards. Uh, I'd also like to warmly welcome our guest speakers who I'll introduce to you shortly. As Gonzo said, my name is John Jackson. I am the president of the Western Pacific Pharmaceutical Forum and it is my great pleasure to co-host this event, Regional Needs and Drivers for Transforming Vaccination in the Western Pacific. Just a few words by way of introduction. Immunisation is a success story of global health and development. Huge progress has been achieved in vaccine development, particularly when we look at new and emerging diseases, with COVID-19 being an obvious example. Despite these successes, significant challenges still exist and the benefits of immunisation are not shared equally with countries across the Western Pacific region. The WHO immunisation agenda for 2030 is a vision for the next decade for everyone, everywhere, at every age to fully benefit from vaccines. And this means reduced mortality and morbidity via equitable access to existing and new vaccines, and an important building block will be strengthening immunisation delivery in primary healthcare. Building on our wide distribution and ready, ready access as pharmacists in large and small communities across our region, we can play three key roles in ensuring equitable access to immunisation. First, with our expertise in medicine supply chain and cold storage, we can provide safe and secure distribution of vaccines. Second, with our specialist knowledge about medicines, including vaccines, and our high level of public trust, we can advise on and promote vaccination. But thirdly, we can increase the public's access by engaging in the administration of vaccines. And FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and health technologies. And our mission, is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practices, sciences, and education. And we're pleased to deliver this event titled, Regional Needs and Drivers for Transforming Vaccination in the Western Pacific. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you my co-moderator for this evening, Parisa Aslani. Professor Parisa Aslani is the Professor of Medicines Use Optimization at the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy. Her research has impacted policy and education in the healthcare sector at the Australian government level and has led to global initiatives on developing medicines information strategies for implementation at national and local levels. Parisa is also a vice president of the FIP. Parisa, I'd welcome your thoughts. Thank you very much, John, um, and welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you logging in to listen to this webinar today. Um, John has done a great introduction for the session, and I'll tell you just a little bit about John himself. Um, John is a pharmacist with a broad experience and expertise in pharmacy practice, policy, and governance. Currently, John is engaged in research at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, to develop enhanced roles for pharmacists in primary care, as well as metrics for pharmacy services. 
Many of you may be familiar with John through his role as president of the Western Pacific Pharmaceutical Forum. John is heavily involved in supporting the development of practice, particularly through the implementation of the WHO FIP Good Pharmacy Practice Guidelines. Um, you also heard a little bit from our facilitator, Gonzo um, Susa Pinto, who's our lead for practice development and transformation at FIP. Um, I will pass you on back to John, who'll do some housekeeping, but just a reminder that use the chat if you would like to chat and use the Q&A button to write down any questions for any one of the speakers. Thank you, John. Thanks, Parisa. It's great to have you here co-moderating. As you can see on the screen, this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to listen back to it later. It's also being live streamed via Facebook. You'll be able to go, uh, go to fip.org to be able to access the uh, streaming of this. As Parisa said, please get engaged, use the chat box to ask questions, and we'd particularly suggest you enter your questions in the chat box while the speakers are giving their presentations so they have an opportunity to address those at the end of their talks. We'll also ideally have a group uh, discussion at the end. Your feedback on this event, one of many delivered by FIP in this medium, uh, is welcome at webinars at fip.org. And finally, if you aren't already, I'd strongly recommend you to join the global family and become a member of FIP. Parisa, would you like to introduce this program? Thank you very much, John. Um, so welcome to the Transforming Vaccination Regionally and Globally program, which is the first FIP transformation outcome-based online program of its kind underpinned by the FIP development goals. Final outcome of the program is a historic global FIP commitment to action on vaccination in pharmacy, an FIP transforming vaccination collection 2021. May I get the next slide please? The series will run from September to December. Series one is the first of three series and it involved eight events that looked at the identification of needs to transform vaccination globally and regionally for science, practice, workforce and education. This involved identifying the needs of the pharmacist and pharmaceutical scientist workforce to deliver on vaccination transformation globally and regionally. The series looked at strategy and policy for global change, addressing barriers and transforming the workforce with re various representatives from member organizations globally sharing their insights and experiencing to help challenge and progress pharmacist vaccination globally and regionally. The clear and pressing needs of science, practice and workforce, as well as education were identified. And this led into series two, where the needs identified in series one to transform vaccinations globally um, and regionally in science, practice, workforce and education were used as a stepping stone to identify actions to transform vaccination through identifying mechanisms linked to the FIP development goals. Now in series two, also composed of eight episodes that focused on the FIP development goals, but from the perspective of vaccination to identify actions to transform vaccination globally and regionally. So this series develops, delivers on the needs identified and sets transformative goals by deconstructing vaccination in pharmacy through the FIP development goals across the entire profession of pharmacy. This series aims to identify mechanisms and drivers to progress the most relevant FIP development goals in the context of transforming vaccination. It looked at FIP development goals such as number 10, equity and equality in access to vaccination by all to improve health globally, and 13, policy development, and 19, patient safety. 
17 of the FIP development goals are linked to vaccination. Concrete mechanisms have been identified to transform vaccination globally and regionally. The tools and structures to enable nations and regions to achieve global transformation of vaccination were shared in these events, and this is led into Series 3. Now, Series 3 will focus on FIP member organizations across six regions and how they have addressed or will address these actions to deliver on the commitment to transform vaccines globally and regionally. You will now see a short video that would demonstrate Series 3. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, we've got some questions here. Uh, we'll put them in the chat box and think about those questions as you engage with this session. You can type your answers in the chat. And if you've got any further questions, you can put them in the Q&A. So if we move on to today's learning objectives, Today's learning objectives are about understanding the Western Pacific perspective in delivering on the transformation of vaccination globally and regionally. And so we will find out from our three speakers around these topics in their specific countries. Next slide, please. So for today's session, as you noted, we are the moderators and Gonzalo will be facilitating, but our three presenters are Peter Guthrie from Australia, Gilda Sabua Salje from the Philippines, and Scarlett Hong from Hong Kong. So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Peter Guthrie. Peter holds the position of senior pharmacist strategic policy at the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, the government recognized peak body for pharmacists. Peter supports policy development, advocacy activities, regulatory submissions and practice advice. In the past year, Peter has driven practice advice for pharmacists responding to COVID-19 and the society's medicine safety agenda. Peter maintains practice as a community pharmacist working in an after hours role in one of Melbourne's very busy 24 hour super care pharmacies with a strong focus on primary care services such as vaccination, triage and referral of acute symptoms, opioid pharmacotherapy and provision of medicines information. His professional interests are reflected in a passion for patient experience, digital health, medicine safety and professional social media. Please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you. Well, thank you, Parisa. And that's a very old photo of me with a definitely pre-pandemic haircut attached to it. So um, tonight I'm, I'm coming to you from Canberra, which is Australia's national capital city. And behind me, I have a lovely image um, where I'm staying of the gum nuts from the eucalypt, which is one of Australia's native plants. Um, as Parisa mentioned, uh, I do work for the Peak Pharmacists uh, representative body here in Australia, and a large part of our role is supporting um, the growth and development of pharmacist administered vaccines in Australia. So as a way of scene setting on our next slide, Australia is a country of around 25 million people. Uh, within this country, we have three levels of government, and the two that are most relevant in talking about the regulations surrounding vaccination are our federal government, 
um, our national government, which regulates the supply, so which regulates our medicine regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and also is responsible for the funding of primary care services, um, including general practice and the funding of medicines on our pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Our state governments, of which we have six major states and two um, territories, uh, is responsible for our poisons regulations. So that's the legality in terms of the administration of medicines, the supply of medicines, and also runs the majority of hospitals, which are public hospitals, which provide emergency care and um, much of the acute care and much of the elective surgeries provided by our private hospital system. And when it comes to vaccination in Australia, over 90% of children in Australia are fully vaccinated according to our national immunisation schedules. That drops down to 72% when you're looking at adolescents in the age range between around 12 and 18 years of age and drops further um, to 50% for adults. And one of the major reasons that is much lower for adults is some of the adult injections which aren't routinely picked up, including influ seasonal influenza, which is part of our national recommendations for annual vaccination for most people. There are, even when you look further into some vulnerable communities, such as people where English may not be their primary language or people who are in other um, low socioeconomic groups, the rates of vaccination in that adult population falls even further to less than 40%. So when we're looking towards what role can pharmacists play, the biggest potential for pharmacists is to start working in that adult space initially. But it wasn't all that long ago that pharmacists didn't do very many vaccinations or any vaccinations at all in Australia. The next slide shows how many vaccinations pharmacists in Australia were able to administer um, back in 2014. And the answer to that was exactly zero. Um, this Australia by Western standards was a relatively late adopter into influenza vaccination. Um, other comparable countries that we often compare our health systems to being Canada, the United Kingdom and USA had got in to pharmacists administered vaccination significantly earlier. The next slide shows that in February 2014, a pilot was run in the state of Queensland just on influenza vaccination. The PSA, as well as the Pharmacy um, Guild of Australia, partnered with the Queensland Government to trial pharmacist administered vaccination in Australia for the first time. Within four months, this was expanded further to add more vaccines. And the next slide shows that within a relatively short space of time, one vaccine being able to be administered in one state of Australia very quickly um, moved to further states. So the next slide, which I think is possibly 2016, um, shows that very quickly all states adopted influenza vaccination and we started to add more vaccines to pharmacists, um, I guess toolkit of vaccines that we're able to administer. To be able to administer vaccines in Australia, pharmacists did need to do additional training, and that training was different in every state and territory to meet the legal requirements of that particular state and territory. I'm one of the many pharmacists who has moved from one state to another in, since they started becoming a pharmacist vaccinator, and that has meant that I've had to basically repeat the training and undergo bridging training to maintain my accreditation as a pharmacist vaccinator. In addition to the, to the requirements of that foundation training, we also need to maintain first aid certificates, an annual um, CPR or pulmonary resuscitation um, certificate, as well as uh, maintain ongoing continuing development um, about vaccines as well. The next slide shows further development around the country as more and more vaccines became part of our repertoire. And when we move to the next one, which I think was February 2019, nearly all states have nearly aligned um, in many ways with a large range of vaccines. So we should see those in the next slide popping up soon, um, with a couple of states as outliers. There was an agreement um, through the Council of Australian Government um, Health Group, which is a combination of all the health ministers in all states and territories, as well as the Commonwealth, to try and align the requirements around Australia. And from memory, that was around 2018. Um, since then, um, we have seen more vaccines um, come into the pharmacist arsenal. And the next slide shows our current state in Australia, which is December 2020, which sees nearly all states um, with a similar range of vaccines. But something quite significant that happened earlier this year, or it's been long, it could have been late last year, was that the Queensland government agreed to a significant number of additional vaccines that pharmacists were able to administer. And those are highlighted 
in this slide in the um, purple magenta colour there. Uh, and significantly, that included the COVID-19 vaccine. So in this year, and it happened significantly in advance of the development of any vaccines that the Queensland government provided the regulatory pathway for pharmacists to be in a position to administer that vaccine. The next slide shows that there are other variations between states. Most states in Australia started with the minimum age that pharmacists could administer was were only adults. And as we saw in that initial slide, adults were the priority population because they had the largest under vaccination rate. Since that time, progressively when all of these vaccine ranges have changed, we've also seen a few other factors change. And one of those has been the age and the minimum age at which pharmacists who are trained can administer vaccines. So in most states of Australia, for most vaccines, that's now 16 years of age. Um, in Victoria, which is my primary practice location, that's now 15 years of age. But for influenza vaccinations, all states have now adopted a 10 year minimum age, reflecting that that is an annual vaccination, and it's not one, but a number of people in that age bracket will be regularly seeing a, another vaccinator in their regular healthcare um, to be able to access. And certainly, one of the things that we see in my practice is we have families come in, um, and it might be mum and dad and a range of their um, children or adolescents will come in and they ask for their vaccines all to be administered for influenza at the same time. And so what we've seen up until this point is that pharmacists are now one of the top, uh, alongside um, general practitioners and nurses who are able to administer vaccines, pharmacists are now one of the three primary vaccinators for influenza vaccine in Australia. We certainly see large vaccination programs roll out through both our community pharmacies and in states where it's permitted also through workplace clinics um, and at some outreach services as well, where I, you know, particularly this year we saw that um, in some cases pharmacists would travel to a consumer's home and administer um, a, say, a vaccination there with their state regulation allowed them to do so. And for people who are self-isolating in our uh, vaccination season for influenza, which is around that March, April, May, June period each year, being in the Southern Hemisphere, um, for a lot of people who weren't leaving their home, that was a really valued service by those consumers. Generally speaking, the vaccines in Australia are funded by the consumer where they're administered by a pharmacist. There are a couple, and the service fee, no matter where you are in Australia, is always um, paid for by either the consumer or if a workplace is paying for a vaccine as part of a workplace seasonal influenza program, that fee may be paid for by their employer. But generally speaking, outside of Victoria, where if you are eligible for a government funded vaccine under the National Immunisation Program, that we are able to administer government funded vaccines um, to consumers. Or if you're in the Australian Capital Territory or Western Australia, where there is currently trials on using that program to administer influenza vaccines, the consumers need to um, pay for the cost of the, both the vaccine, but also for the service fee for the pharmacist providing that service. The next slide shows a um, what I'd like to see is a, a typical vaccination environment. This is a, the consultation room that I use at the pharmacy that I work in. We also have a part-time nursing service in this pharmacy, so the room is very, very well set up um, for the service. But typical requirements for a pharmacist vaccination service when it's offered by a community pharmacy includes that you need to have a, a day bed or equivalent, or in some states a, a chair would be adequate for that, um, so the consumer can lie down. You, you must have space for a carer to be present in the room and you must have space for the pharmacist to freely manoeuvre and all the standard things you'd expect, which would be um, adrenaline kits in case you needed those uh, and access to sharks, um, to materials and disposal as well. Um, the next slide shows, I think, some of the areas that we're really focused on growing pharmacist role in vaccination here in Australia. The first and most obvious of those at the moment is the COVID-19 vaccination strategy. Um, unlike some other countries that, um, around the world which are really accelerating their vaccination programs, Australia has relatively early access to a number of the vaccine candidates, but given Australia's current state of stability and success in suppressing um, coronavirus, we don't have the same urgency that some other countries do to, to roll out a vaccination strategy. The government's currently at the point where they've released um, Australia's vaccination policy and working through the logistics of how, how that may roll out, and that's a situation similar to most countries. Uh, from the pharmaceutical society's perspective, um, we say that pharmacist vaccinators will be needed to provide capacity in Australia, not just to vaccinate Australians against COVID-19 with its um, likely two-shot two strategy, 
but also to um, pick up other vaccines, um, vaccination within the workforce as other vaccinators may be diverted to try and support um, the COVID-19 vaccination programs. We don't want to start to see drop-offs in the vaccination rates of other um, vaccine preventable, disease, preventable diseases such as influenza, um, hepatitis and some of those other conditions. So we see this as an opportunity to go to government with a solution that says pharmacists are a very important part of the capacity. Yes, we're well, we've got the skills to be able to vaccinate against COVID-19, but we also have the skills to do a wider range of vaccines if there is pressure on vaccination generally. So our position is that now is the appropriate time for all other governments around the country to follow Queensland's lead and um, make the regulatory changes in advance of that policy rolling out to allow pharmacists to be part of that strategy. Um, the Australia's COVID vaccination policy also identifies some priority groups for COVID-19 um, vaccination. And one of those is people who are involved in the care of others. And our strong position is that any pharmacist or supporting staff member who is in a patient care role should be prioritised for early vaccination. And the policy doesn't clearly state currently who this group will be, but we would consider this should include at a minimum community pharmacists, hospital pharmacists, pharmacists who work in aged care settings, pharmacists who work in general practice and medical centres, and pharmacists who go into people's home to conduct home medicine reviews. Um, one of the really important, um, being a new, new vaccine, will be the pharmacovigilance. And, it's, it's, and where one of our key messaging is that no matter who provides that COVID-19 vaccination, there needs to be an effective monitoring system for adverse events. Pharmacovigilance will be very important. So there's a need for that to integrate with existing clinical software. And we're making that as a, if it's not in the workflow, it won't get recorded effectively. And that is a strong position we're pushing. And one quite nice and unique part of Australia's vaccination policy for COVID-19 is that remuneration um, must be such that the consumer is not to have any out-of-pocket costs, and that's part of the Australian government's policy for receiving the COVID-19 vaccination. So the governments around Australia will need to work out funding models to ensure that no matter how the program is delivered, there is no out-of-pocket cost for consumers in Australia to receive um, their two COVID-19 vaccinations. And um, our government has had early access to us had the, the th three of the leading candidates and a large number of vaccines, but how that will roll out is still being worked through at the moment. Outside of COVID-19 vaccination, uh, removing barriers to the range of vaccine that pharmacists are able to administer is a, is a very strong priority. And we've seen already some quite considerable advances through those um, maps that I showed of being able to add vaccines to our repertoire as we've been able to demonstrate over a number of years Pharmacist vaccination is safe, it's effective, and that people can have confidence and trust in their pharmacist who administers the vaccination. And we continue to work with the governments around the country. Um, as always, there are some um, differences between the, either the politics or the need in different states and territories. And we work with governments to remove barriers wherever possible so that people can um, access whatever vaccines they need from any of their vaccinators. Outside Victoria, as I mentioned, consumer access to government-funded vaccines through the National Immunisation Program is really limited. And it is really important because if they get that vaccine from a pharmacist or a doctor or a nurse, the consumer shouldn't be disadvantaged that one provider who might be available is unable to access the funded vaccine for them compared to another vaccinator who's in a, in a different building and, and trained for a different profession. From the consumer's point of view, they still have an entitlement to that vaccine. And so we're working with governments around the country to try and figure out how can we resolve this um, anomaly? In Australia, we also have an Australian Immunisation Register, which is the merging of a number of national vaccine registers, including the Childhood Immunisation Register, that was around, has been around for a while, and now every Australian has um, a, a, a full record of their all immunisations and vaccinations they have received um, since that came into force a few years ago. That at the moment still remains a voluntary upload in, in many situations. Some states require pharmacists to upload to that record, but there are some challenges for having full and complete records. And it is absolutely essential that over time, when children have all their vaccines, that all of those records are collected there. And then as adults, as they continue to get their vaccines, that they continue to be uploaded to that record, which also synchronises with their government um, subsidised or government um, owned My Health record where consumers can go and look at all of their health information that gets uploaded there. Their vaccination record is an important part of that central record, which is still a relatively recent innovation in Australia. 
Um, and so when it comes to things like COVID-19 vaccination, where it may be a gateway requirement, just like influenza vaccines are now a gateway requirement to visiting a relative in aged care, for example, it's important that people are able to access those records when they need it. And it's also important that those records are there so that we have really good population health data to understand how vaccines are being administered and really preventing the disease spread through the community. I touched on location. We are, have seen some states drop requirements which limit pharmacist vaccination, say, to a community pharmacy, um, or they may say you may have to go outside of pharmacy, but you need to be linked within the clinical governance of a pharmacy. More and more, we're seeing hospitals in outpatient settings being able to have their pharmacists been able to administer vaccines in different parts of the country, and some parts, as I said, those workplace programs exist. And from a, from a um, patient and a consumer point of view, we don't see a reason why that can't happen. So we continue to work with governments there. And we also continue to work um, on ensuring that there's a really robust system for reporting and follow up with adverse events as well. Um, and that I think probably is, is a, provides a, a summary of where we're up to with pharmacists role with vaccinations in Australia. Um, more than happy to take questions, but I hope that gives you an insight into the role we're playing. It's certainly a service that I get a, have had a lot of personal satisfaction from being able to be part of, which I found really interesting because um, one of my initial reasons for becoming a pharmacist was that needles and surgery scared me. So it scared me away from other health professions. So it's, become, it's been an evolution of practice for me and it's been an evolution of practice for many of my colleagues here in Australia as well. Gita, thank you very, very much. An excellent overview. Um, yes, I will prompt people to put questions into the chat box. Um, Peter's given you a, a wonderful demonstration of how a stepwise rapid expansion of the uptake of vaccination can occur. I note in the comments, uh, Nobu from Japan, suggesting that actually at the moment it's only doctors who can vaccinate. But that's an example of the kind of barrier that we need to address. And if you have a question about that or anything else that Peter uh, spoke about, please put it into the chat box and, uh, and Peter can address them. Um, we have not got any specific questions there at the moment, but uh, very happy to take any questions and get Peter to address them. He won't be able to stay with us for the whole evening. Uh, so uh, get, your, get the opportunity in now. And uh, if you have a question for Peter. If there are no questions, perhaps we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, and it's uh, Parisa, Sorry, you wanted to... There is, a, there is a question here. Yeah, please. Um, I have got a question reg um, here regarding what are some of the barriers that Australia has faced when trying to introduce vaccination by pharmacists that other nations who haven't as yet introduced vaccination can learn from? It's a really good question. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and it depends, I think, on what part of the country that you've been in. Um, certainly the, a number of the barriers that have been outlined in FIP's vaccination advocacy toolkit, which um, exists, does highlight that um, there are always um, barriers between health professionals. So um, other health professions may not be quite that happy with you being involved, but it really, when working with government, it's a case of, um, you don't have an inherent right as a health professional to move into um, new areas of practice, even though you might have the skills and competence to do so. Um, to achieve regulatory change, you need to find uh, problems that the government needs support in solving because that creates the prompt to start working on regulatory change. So, um, for example, if um, somebody said, well, we've got the skills to, to vaccinate um, in young children, it's a slightly more risky cohort, not significantly more risky. But when we look at Australia's vaccination rates, there's not a dramatic need that that addresses. So I think sometimes the barriers are to um, need to clearly define the problem that you can um, support the solution for. Um, and if you can't clearly describe that, um, it's unlikely that you're going to sort of be able to achieve the removal of the barriers that you're seeking.
Thank you. Um, John, we do have another question from yes. Suzanne Zulzaga from Mongolia for, for Peter. Um, and the question is, what was the first step to transfer vaccinations to pharmacies or to open vaccinations to pharmacies? What would you recommend to, developing, to a developing country? Uh, did you change pharmacy education program uh, first uh, or what, what was the first step towards that, achieving that goal? So the, the, the initial stages in Australia came through a, a pilot program that was run um, in conjunction between the, the Queensland government the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia and the Pharmacy Guild of Australia and the, and the Guild represents the interests of pharmacy, community pharmacy owners in Australia. And I th the, that didn't happen in the tertiary education course. A customised course was developed to help develop the skills and competency concept. The competencies were achieved through going back to our competency standards that we get trained to as pharmacists looking at the gaps that were there and identifying what training needed to be done and delivered and, and signed off for the government to have confidence that pharmacists had the skills to do it. So part of that training deals with injection technique because that's not a standard part of undergraduate training. Part of that training deals with um, some of the practicalities of immunisation and part of that training just deals with the infectious diseases generally in terms of how the vaccines um, do and also think about cold chain and how the Australian vaccination system works. But the only way you can create that training is by going back through and saying, okay, what, what, what are our pharmacists currently trained in? We went back to the competency standards here in Australia, identified those gaps. And then as part of the solution to government said, okay, this is what needs to be happened so you can have confidence that pharmacists will be able to do it safely. A large part of it also in the trial was that there was a strong support through technology solutions so that that quickly could be communicated to government. Here are the outcomes of the program. So um, records were not uh, are often through our trial programs in Australia done through um, our electronic software, and there is an investment by some um, often by the software providers that is part of, of doing that. So it's really about going to the government with the full solution and saying here's how it work, here's how it could happen. If you get some interest really working up that full solution to them rather than saying, okay, it's a good idea, can you do most of this work for us? You really need to go and in Australia, we, we really work to provide the full solution which gave confidence um, in moving forward. Thank you, Do we have other questions? Yes, we do, we do have another question from Jack Shen from uh, Malaysia. And the question is related to uh, public acceptance of the service. And so it, Jack is asking if there were any issues in terms of um, the public trusting uh, pharmacies to deliver vaccines or if there were any issues of public uh, acceptance of the service initially. I don't, I'm not aware of any significant public reluctance to be involved with pharmacist vaccination. Certainly awareness initially was quite low about the service. Um, but when people become aware of it, there's actually a degree of excitement or, oh, that's convenient, that's easy. Uh, I, I work in a 24-hour pharmacy, so I probably see that in a more amplified way where I, I've sometimes done 2 a.m. Or, or 11 p.m. at night vaccinations because that's when it's been most convenient for the person. So the access of community pharmacy and the trust that um, Australian consumers place in their pharmacists and pharmacists routinely place in the top five or ten professions every year in Australia and the trust scores when people are surveyed about what professionals do you trust. Um, there's a very strong trust in, in community pharmacists and pharmacists generally. So we didn't see a lot of reluctance, but I think for some people, they don't really understand where it fits and certainly some of those funding barriers where, well, if I go to my, jet, um, to my doctor and they can access it through the National Immunisation Program and, that, and their um, consultation with their doctor is funded through our Medicare system, I think cost was a barrier for some people more so than an acceptance of the pharmacist role. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we do not have any further questions, John, so I think we um, can move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation, and uh, thanks, Gonzo, for fielding those questions. Uh, and to all of our uh, people online, if you've got further questions, please uh, submit them and we'll address them uh, as and when we get time. So I'd like us to now move on to our second speaker and it uh, gives me a great pleasure to uh, introduce to you a friend of mine, Gilda Sabua Salje from the Philippines. Uh, Gilda is uh, a newly elected president of the Philippine Pharmacists Association. She's the first person from her region of Mindanao to hold that role and her aim in being 
uh, president of PPHA is to advocate for pharmacy practice and community services throughout the Philippines. Uh, she's a graduate of the uh, um, University of the Immaculate Conception in Davao City, uh, and she has worked in pharmacy, in uh, medical centres, uh, in uh, diagnostics companies, and uh, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, she served as the president of her uh, local chapter in Davao City, uh, where she led reorganisation and restructure of that chapter, tremendously increasing membership, and I'm sure that uh, experience will be useful for her in her new role as president of PPHA. Um, She's, uh, she co-chaired the uh, PPHA National Convention in 2014 and the, uh, was the overall chair of the National Convention in uh, last year, 2019 in Manila, both of which I can speak personally, uh, were fantastic events. Um, Gilda pioneered the Pharmacy Roadshow Project focusing on antimicrobial resistance that was adopted and expanded by PPHA uh, nationwide. So, uh, wide experience there, and Gilda, I'd like to invite you to speak to us about uh, the situation with regards to vaccination in the Philippines. Thank you, Gilda. Okay, good morning, good noon, good afternoon, good evening, fellow pharmacists, wherever you are. Uh, I'm so delighted in behalf of the Philippine Pharmacists Association to share with you our journey towards transforming pharmacy-based vaccination in the Philippines. So it all started in 2000 when former CEO Luke Bisanson, who was our guest speaker during our national convention with BPP Professional Secretary Emma Paulino, together with the PPHA leaders, headed by Ms. Leonila Ocampo, who was then the PPHA president. So visited the office of our FDA Director General in a courtesy call and discussed about the trends on the global pharmacy practice until the pharmacy-based immunization program discussion was put on the table. And it ignited the interest of uh, the FDA Director upon realizing the importance of the availability of the pharmacy-based immunization service in the country. And on September 14, uh, September 2014, he issued an advisory to the different government and private stakeholders. And so multi-stakeholders uh, meeting were called during that year. And in 2015, core group formation and the module development started with our pharmacy experts on immunization. And in 2016, the Philippine pharmacy law was enacted and immunization was already included as one of the provisions of the law under the scope of practice of pharmacists in the Philippines. In 2017, we had the core trainers training and in 2018 and in 2019, we expanded to the different regions with the regional trainers training. And in 2020, this year, we have alignment meetings, series of alignment meetings with our professional regulation commission, with the Food and Drug Administration and the Department of Health. So we need to do some innovations you now with the limitations brought by the COVID-19 pandemic on how the program uh, would uh, further be expanded and rolled out to the pharmacy practitioners on the ground. And this stage, so this is still on, prog uh, on progress. Next slide, please. Now I'm showing you the copy of uh, the FDA advisory that I was talking about. No? It was released in 2014 with the subject Food and Drug Administration, Philippine Pharmacists Association, uh, MAL plan to authorize community pharmacists to administer vaccines. And so far after that advisory was released, no, there was no significant objections or opposition from other healthcare professionals. And so with that, Philippine Pharmacists Association initiated stakeholders consultations with the Department of Health, with the Food and Drug Administration, 
with the Professional uh, Regulation Commission Board of Pharmacy, with the chain pharmacy operators, with the medical doctors from Philippine Foundation for Vaccination, and the pharmaceutical industry, the academe, and the nurses groups. Next slide, please. Now showing you here the provision of the Philippine Pharmacy Law that included already the administration of adult vaccines. And adult vaccines here in the law refers to cervical cancer, flu or influenza, pneumococcal and other pre-exposure prophylactic vaccines to be administered to patients aged 18 years old and above. And uh, we did not include administration of pediatric vaccines yet no, under this provision. Next slide, please. Here I want to show you the pharmacy law that uh, the Republic Act 10918, an act regulating the modernized and modernizing the practice of pharmacy in the Philippines, approved by the Senate and the House of Representatives and the President of the Republic of the Philippines. So also here showing you pictures of the immunization core group and the module developers and the front page also of the pharmacy-based immunization training program instructors manual. Next slide. So in summary, let me show you where are we now or on our journey towards transforming vaccination in the country. First, uh, the Philippine Pharmacy Law team uh, by the PPHA uh, successfully worked towards the enactment of the Philippine Pharmacy Law that already included in the provisions the administration of adult vaccines by the pharmacists alongside with the immunizing pharmacist group. And next, uh, the promulgation of the implementing rules and regulations of the pharmacy law happened, uh, followed by the development of the pharmacy-based immunization training program. And next we had, in, uh, we endorsed the program to the Professional Regulations Commission and the Food and Drug Administration uh, for them, no, for they will be responsible for the certification, the regulation and implementation respectively. And next step, we had the FDA, uh, they already released an administrative order on additional services of pharmacists that included adult vaccinations by, uh, by pharmacists. And here we are now. Uh, we are just waiting for the Professional Regulation Commission Board resolution for the certificate, uh, certification of pharmacists as immunizers. So our target date for this stage is, uh, will be on January of 2021 next year. So by that time, uh, we will be ready for the rollout of the training of pharmacists and EPHA will be the one responsible to issue the certificate of training once uh, they completed the program. And the Professional Regulation Commission Board of Pharmacy will be responsible to issue the certification, the certification of the immunizing pharmacists. And finally, by that time, the Philippines will already be ready you know, for the, uh, the pharmacy-based immunization program in the Philippines. So at this point, um, I would like to thank you know, for, uh, FIP, the major influencer for the changes and the transformation of the pharmacy practice in the Philippines. Uh, FIP has been a big help to us uh, in this uh, direction, the giving the direction towards the uh, achieving this program. And it has been very significant to bring in global personalities at our end, especially from FIP in ma our major negotiations with the government, citing global strategies and benchmarking with the existing global trends of pharmacy practice had somehow enhanced and complemented our own strategies in the Philippines and mechanisms facilitate towards the progression of the program. So it cannot be overemphasized that when discussions on the table is about medicine, especially when we discuss it with the government and other stakeholders, pharmacists must always be in. 
and immunization in line with the FIP developmental goals towards transforming vaccination is so timely at this point and therefore this is our priority now in the Philippines. And moving forward, despite the barriers and the challenges of this pandemic, I believe that we should learn to turn these trials into opportunities. So that's all. Good luck to all of us. Thank you for listening and be safe wherever you are. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, can you please type them in the Q&A and we'll be able to answer them. Um, may I just begin, I guess, by asking a little bit about the pediatric vaccination and whether there are any plans for the future and what are those plans, if there are any. At this point, we did not include uh, pediatric uh, vaccinations um, because of you know, the, the objections from the pediatric groups. Uh, but uh, we are just starting you now with the adult vaccination to make it easier for us to start with the program. But we are not closing the doors now for having that, but this is a still far-fetched at this point. Great, thank you very much. Just coming back to an earlier question, how has the public um, accepted the role of the pharmacist in terms of vaccination? And what have been some of the challenges? In the Philippines, since we have not yet rolled out um, the program down to our community pharmacies, we are still at the level of uh, after the, the trainers training. Um, what we have so far, we did not receive any, objection, receive any objections or oppositions from other stakeholders like the medical group, since we only uh, started with the adult vaccination. So with the public, um, I believe that with the support of the government and the other stakeholders, to, uh, we are expecting a good acceptance for all of this. And PPHA is really doing our effort to give the correct information, the right, um, you know, that's, that's why we are really very careful in giving this training to make sure that when we have the, the pharmacist vaccinators, you know, that uh, we will be starting it right and uh, we will have a good feedback and we'll get the trust of the public in the future. Thank you. I believe we've got a couple of questions coming in through. Yes, we do. We have, we have a question from Dr. Lulu Bravo um, from the Philippines, a pediatrician and a former WHO advisor on, on vaccines. Um, who is in charge of training pharmacists in the Philippines uh, for vaccine-related vaccine services? Okay, the training program will be handled by the Philippine Pharmacists Association. We already have our training program in place and it's ready. Uh, this was uh, developed by our experts who have been also vaccinators back in the US and they came back to the Philippines to share with us you know, their expertise. So we have already started with our core uh, trainers training and the regional trainers training also. So after this, then we will be rolling out this to the rest of the community pharmacists when we're ready. Thank you very much, Gilda. And we do have another question from uh, Ms. Nina Martinez. Um, and she's asking when the training will be reaching Visayas. So that's a, sort of a domestic question, but you may, you may uh, want to comment on that. Okay, so your uh, question is when? Um, we are targeting next year uh, to be rolled out to the regions, Mindanao, Visayas, and Luzon. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and then we have a, a question from uh, Mr. Ronald Goose from Canada, uh, and he's uh, the chair of the FIP uh, Forum for Regulators, for Professional Regulators. Hello, Ron. Thank you for your question. Um, the question is, will pharmacists have access to national vaccination records and be able to document in those records in the, in the Philippines? Yes, okay, we are uh, into that direction and we want to ensure that control measures are in place and proper patient screening also will be done prior to vaccination. Then we should have that proper documentation and reporting of patients uh, being vaccinated as well as the, to, uh, also having that reporting of adverse effects following uh, 
um, immunization. So we are to that direction to have that um, uh, the the immunization registry in the country. Thank you very much, Kilda. Uh, we have another question that was sent via the chat tool uh, from Libya. Uh, are all kinds of vaccines permitted to be handled by pharmacist vaccinators? Uh, here in the Philippines, as I uh, cited a while ago in my slides, uh, we only will be handling, pharmacists will only be handling uh, adult vaccines, uh, specifically cervical cancer, pneumococcal, flu, and influenza at this point. And other um, vaccines that will be uh, you know, identify with the government if they would allow us, but that would be in a later time. Thank you. Uh, and we did receive another couple of questions um, uh, from uh, through the, the Q and A box. One from Susanna Sulzaga from uh, Mongolia. What is the key issue to certify pharmacists? Just a moment. The question disappeared. What, what was the key issue to certify pharmacists for this, for this role? And how was the FIP influence? How did FIP influence um, the development of this program exactly? Was it a financial or technical support? Uh, what type of support did you receive from FIP? Okay, I did mention that I'm so thankful with uh, FIP. The support was really uh, because it started uh, when they had that courtesy call, uh, with our FDA Director General, and it all started when I mean, he released an advisory after talking to Mr. Luke Visanson, the CEO then of FIP. And um, with that, I think uh, the importance of the accessibility of pharmacy and the availability of pharmacy in the community was, uh, you know, was seen by the Director General. And so he released that advisory. And because of that, that's the that's the first step that happened. And when uh, there was no uh, objection from the other stakeholders, and then so we had started doing the modules, discussing on how, uh, moving forward on how we could um, put in place the immunization uh, program in the Philippines. So, uh, and, and all of that, uh, we've been uh, talking to a lot of FIP uh, officers through our PPHA, um, former presidents and officers also. So they were guided by the FIP as well. Thank you. Ponte, you are on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, we have a question from Naziru Kudirat from Nigeria and the question is whether the training is only meant for community pharmacists or also hospital pharmacists are included in the program. Um, at this point, we are considering community pharmacy as a priority and the hospital pharmacy group as well, since they are uh, the one most accessible in the community level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and a couple of uh, questions from colleagues in the Philippines as well. Uh, one of them is whether the, the training will be uh, free, uh, for free. And the other one is again from uh, uh, Ms. Nina Martinez. And she says that as a registered pharmacist and a registered nurse, will she still be required to undergo the training or, it, or not? Is, is the training waived in that case? Um, okay. Um... We are still working on some of the details of that. Uh, for example, the nurse pharmacist, because most nurses are already, oh, definitely, they already are trained on how to do the, uh, to, to administer injections. But um, there are a lot of uh, you know, special um, guidelines. Now we have guidelines to, to follow on that. We will be updating you all once uh, the guidelines will be in place already. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no further questions for Gilda. Thank you very much to all uh, participants who have asked questions. Thank you very much, Gilda, for your great presentation. And as you can see, the interest has been unbelievable with a number of questions. Um, and there's, oh, there are also some more comments in the chat as well.
Um, okay, everyone, we will now go on to our last speaker and I'm hoping that Scarlett is able to actually hear us and communicate with us. Um, Scarlett Pong is the president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Hong Kong. She's an incredibly busy uh, person with a really extensive experience. She's been the past chairman steering committee of the Alliance for Healthy Cities, Western Pacific region as well as the organizing chairman for the ninth global conference of the alliance for healthy cities 2021 she's been in the past um, a board member of hospital authority and at district level and in charge of the who's age friendly cities and healthy cities she received the award for pioneers in healthy cities and she's currently a member of the steering committee on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases Please join me in welcoming Scarlett to give us our pres um, the next presentation. Thank you so much. And I wonder if anybody can hear me or see me. We can hear yes. you and we can see you very well. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank FIP for the invitation. It's because um, when we start to think about vaccination, it's because of FIP. We initiate with that ideas from the meeting or focus group that we had years ago. And we find that this is one of the area that we should develop in Hong Kong. And so thanks FIP for that. And if you haven't been to Hong Kong before, I have to tell you that Hong Kong is a not very big place, a city with only 1,106 square kilometers, but we have 7 point, around 7 million people. And when you look at the current situation of vaccination in Hong Kong, of course, we would like to have something like Australia, like Peter has, and also in um, Philippines, right? But one thing is, you know, um, the situation in Hong Kong is like something, um, when you look at our system, there's still no separation of uh, prescribing and also dispensing in Hong Kong. So you can see the situation of pharmacists uh, road in Hong Kong um, is quite limited in a way. So that's why we would like to develop different roles for us, you know, um, especially when we have new ideas from FIP years ago. So when we talk about vaccination services, we are developing now in Hong Kong, but of course um, it takes time for us to um, develop further. Uh, first of all, after the meeting uh, with FIP um, a few years ago, I actually meet up with the top official, which is the Secretary for Food and Health, and also the Dean of Hong Kong University, Faculty of Medicine, to get their uh, ideas or their opinions on, you know, what do they think of pharmacists road of vaccination. And both of us really delighted to to say that you know, pharmacists should be in this role to help us to do vaccination and explore or expand the vaccination rate. But one thing is after they agree with that, it's really hard to push uh, below in different departments because there's no law to that road in a way that, uh, of course, we also say that there's no regulations uh, to stop pharmacists to do vaccination. We can do that, but they don't specify that pharmacists can do vaccination at the same time as well. But uh, when we look at our vaccines in Hong Kong, they are prescription item. That means that we can actually um, get the vaccine and do it ourselves. It has to be under doctor prescription or under doctor supervision before we can do that. And as for reimbursement, because Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, the government actually has a, a reimbursement program uh, for the doctor or even for pharmacists. If we are under the supervision of doctors, we can actually get reimbursement for that. And payment is like, uh, we will have payment from uh, six months to 12 years. You know, uh, government will reimburse for that. And also 50 years old or over, we get reimbursement on that as well. So um, this is something that we can work on uh, for vaccination. 
but in general practice in um, in Hong Kong, the doctor would like to do their own vaccination in their own clinics. So um, of course we can do that in school, like in an outreach uh, um, setting, or in different uh, residential estate, we can also do that as well because that way we can actually um, uh, reach a big group of people. Like for example, uh, where last time when we went to a school outreach program, vaccination program, we did about 800 students, which is primary school students. Okay, so that will be something that um, we can actually work on, but of course we would like to be able to do it ourselves uh, directly or independently. And as for the record, um, we actually can uh, see the record of um, the patient if they have joined the e-health system in Hong Kong, because this is a voluntary uh, program that you can join uh, for the government's program with your health record there. So vaccination record will be on there. So pharmacists will be able to read it, but they won't be able to uh, write something on it yet. Okay, but I talked to them, they said that when it's more mature, we might be able to do it in one or two years time. So um, the second slide, please. So vaccination training and practice. Um, we have uh, the training uh, for our community pharmacists mainly, because uh, this is the role that we would like to be de more developed in the community. And so uh, we have uh, training from UK first, uh, UK training, and also we did have uh, training uh, from US, and also we have local trained by uh, doctors and also um, nursing as well for practical training before we do the outreach vaccination program in school. And as mentioned before, uh, we actually joined the government vaccination subsidized program. So that's why we are being paid for that. And so this is the same rate as the doctor, but we have to split with the doctor for the time being. And we are planning to do the certified training program, jointly organized with the universities. So we are negotiating with the university for uh, details of the program materials and also uh, details of the um, examination and all that. Of course, we find that, you know, um, they have to have, uh, besides vaccination training, they need to have first aid training as well. In addition, um, somebody mentioned about the course or the fee for the program. Uh, we have applied, PSHK have applied fundings from the government. And so we have um, some money from, uh, from the government for continued education. And vaccination will be one of the topics that we will be using the fundings to uh, train our members. So uh, next one, please. Um, we have a few barriers in our cities. First, as I mentioned that, you know, the vaccine is a prescription item. So that's why we would like to classify the vaccine into a P1S1, which is a pharmacy only um, items. And um, we just started to do the influenza vaccines. And in the future, we would like to uh, get a hold of the opportunity that when COVID-19 vaccines uh, are delivered to Hong Kong, because our government would like to probably do it at a very short period of time. So we will try to get the opportunity and see whether we can join the program and also do vaccinations for the public as well in this regards. Uh, secondly, I think the barrier is our insurance um, charges are quite high in Hong Kong uh, because um, we had uh, insurance company that uh, take, take the protection from us, uh, but there are insurance company that thinking um, pharmacists doesn't have experience in that area. So they reluctant to accept our insurance policy. So um, this is something that we have to develop as well. Uh, but we do find insurance company that can help um, on this, but we should be, uh, we hope that we can lower the cost for the pharmacists if they buy the insurance. 
Um, third barrier will be, as I mentioned before, our space for our pharmacy is quite, um, most of them are quite small. So that's why when we talk to the Department of Health, um, they are mentioning that, you know, when, they, when we have the dispensing room, is we, the clients could not go in and we do have to find space uh, with privacy for our clients to do injection, so vaccination. So that's why uh, this is something that we have to look at. But when we say not pharmacy let a pharmacist go outreach, I think we can do more on that. But uh, when we look at community pharmacy, uh, when they are too small in size, it might be a bit difficult uh, for some of the pharmacies to do it at their own uh, pharmacy, pharmacies. Um, the fourth um, barrier will be the vaccination order. Because um, we find that, you know, uh, we have to uh, order the vaccines in advance. And if you don't order in advance, you just don't have stock at all. Like for the past month, uh, all our vaccines were gone. Even the doctor doesn't have any vaccine. So that's why the government have to actually um, deliver some of the order vaccine to the doctors and also to the community. So that's why um, I think this is something that is hard for us to estimate how many vaccines we will be using. And this is one of the difficulties we face. Um, the last barriers will be the uh, other professionals and also public support. I think this will be something that we need to work on so that people trust pharmacists more on um, the professional road as uh, what we did in the past during COVID because for the COVID swap that we did uh, this year, uh, pharmacists actually, uh, we took the initiation to uh, promote to the Secretary for Food and Health and saying that we will do the swap for the public. And so that's why in two weeks, we did about 1.7 million swap, including pharmacists and pharmacy students. So uh, the public think that, you know, um, uh, pharmacists can take an active role in something like urgent happen in emergency. We are one of the professionals that we can support the public. So I hope that uh, the public will look at us as you know, one of the important members, professionals in the community and also other professionals as well. So um, next slide please. So action needed to advance the issue. Uh, first, I think we have to authorize pharmacists to do COVID-19 uh, vaccination first. Um, independently. I hope that when they deliver it, uh, I think we should do the lobbying now so that we can actually, uh, when they have it delivered, we should be able to help them in our hundreds of pharmacists uh, um, in the community to have the injection uh, done as soon as possible. So that's why um, we hope that we will start with the COVID-19 vaccine and also the flu vaccine first before we start other vaccination. But for education and other things, we will, we will continue to do uh, promotions and all that. Uh, secondly, I think reclassification of vaccines is quite important to prescription to pharmacy item. Um, so this one should do some lobbying as well. Uh, third will be invite FIP management to send support letter to our chief executive, um, secretary for food and health, and also pharmacy and poison board, which will help us to do um, a reclassification of drugs. So uh, if they can send some experience or sharing experience of the international community, that will be helpful for them to look at other country as well. Fourth is for us to lobby the members of the pharmacy and poison board who have actually the right to vote for the reclassification. So we should trigger that process so that they can actually discuss on the vaccines, uh, reclassifications. Fifth will be to promote the new role of pharmacists. Um, this is both to our professional uh, colleagues and also uh, to the public as well. So this 
should be done continuously and we are working closely on that as we do a quite a few projects uh, in the community like the NCD and also the medication therapy therapists. Um, this is something that we have been doing in the community and helping especially the elderly. The last one will be uh, we would like to continue to gain the trust uh, from the public and also the healthcare professionals actively. And this will be quite important for us because when we have some changes in the law, I think from the LegCo member and also the public will be quite crucial for the um, changes or the success of our vaccination dream in Hong Kong. So um, last but not the least, thank you once again for FIP for all your work and support. And thank you all and be safe. Scarlett, thank you very, very much for that overview of the situation in Hong Kong. Um, we have some time for a few questions. So uh, Gonzo, uh, are there any questions that have been posed? Um, thank you, John. Yes, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one from Suzanne from Mongolia uh, about the time that it takes for pharmacists to um, become trained to deliver vaccination services in Hong Kong. Um, the time is um, actually depend. We have separate into different sessions. Um, uh, when you say time, it is really hard to count this uh, with certain hours because we are designing another course with University of Hong Kong. But when we look at the last one that we did, uh, because we have uh, the vaccination, um, we will have the vaccine training and we have the technique training, we have the risk management, and then we have the first aid. I think it will be over um, around 50 hours, you know, uh, for the last course that we have. But one thing is, you know, uh, for the new courses that we will be training on, so we haven't decided the details yet, because we would like to propose to the government that after we have the training program, we would like to be endorsed by the government as well. Because PSHK actually uh, have quite a lot of training program that is endorsed by Department of Health. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, and we have a question from uh, Jack Chen Lim from Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much for sharing, uh, Ms. Scarlett. And a question is, um, I understand that the vaccination under doctor's supervision is now on, trial, on a trial in Hong Kong. Just wanted to know, how did the conversation with the doctors actually start? Was it via the, the government uh, or was it through direct contact with the medical association, for example? We haven't directly contacted the medical association on that because um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is no, um, uh, no legal um, um, ordinance or ordinance that saying that pharmacists could not do anything on um, vaccination. So that's why we can do it. It's just because of the vaccine is being classified as prescription item. So that's why uh, we need uh, doctor prescription. And because um, we have doctors do vaccination themselves, so they won't actually give you prescription, right? In reality. So that's why if we actually do uh, tactfully, we do the reclassification, we will actually get the right to do vaccination instead of um, have to ask the permission from the medical doctor. You know what I mean? We, we don't need the approval because there's no law saying that pharmacists could not do vaccination, okay? But one thing is because of the reclassification, the classification of the vaccine. If we can do this in the pharmacy and poison board and lower it to the pharmacy item, P1S1, then we can actually use it and do it for the, for the public. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a couple of other questions, but I think that they would be interesting for uh, the general panel discussion at the end, which could, they are more, they're not specific to Hong Kong, but, but more general in scope. So before we take those questions, John, if you excuse me just to introduce the, 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 the mini survey that we would like 
uh, we invite you to participate. Um, this is, you can use the QR code on this slide and also the, the, um, the link that we will now paste on the, cha on the chat box. And this is just a one minute survey. Basically, we'd just like to know whether community pharmacists or pharmacies in your country will be involved in vaccinating against COVID-19 and also if they will be or are already involved in performing COVID-19 tests at the pharmacy. And, and in that case, if yes, what types of tests can pharmacies uh, perform or collaborate in? And, and, and finally, if you can share with us uh, any uh, URLs, any internet links, or any documents that you can send by email to, to myself at FIP, gspinto at fip.org, with those details of how this will be done, whether a, a medical prescription is required, as Scarlett was just uh, referring to, what are the technical requirements for the service, if and how the test results uh, will be communicated uh, to health authorities, whether we'll be able to input that information into a shared record of some sort, um, whether how, how the supply chain issues will be managed and whether the service will be remunerated. So any details that you can share with us will be much appreciated. So we can gather that intelligence um, at global level, global level, and particularly for the Western Pacific region now. So we do uh, appreciate if you can either go with your phones, just take a picture of that QR code uh, on, on the screen, or just use the link that we have just pasted on the chat box. Thank you very much. And you can do that uh, now, or you can do it after the, after the webinar, of course. Back to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Gunzo. Yes, that's a fantastic opportunity to gather uh, this information from uh, the, the uh, almost 60 people who we have on this uh, program this evening. Uh, and of course, this will be available to those of you who listen in later uh, to this. You'll be able to uh, access that poll and uh, provide us with that information. Uh, look, we, Gonzo, you said there were some other questions uh, just before we go to our wrap up. Let's just uh, see whether there were other questions that uh, um, have been asked that we can pose to either Scarlett uh, or Gilda. Uh, Peter, unfortunately, has had to leave us uh, at this stage. Um, yes, I understand that. Uh, even maybe uh, Parisa and you can, can also join the conversation and add some uh, input to this. Um, so the first question is actually coming from a colleague in Libya. Uh, many countries ha have more than, uh, more than the needed skills, skilled nurses to deliver um, uh, vaccination services. So is there really a need uh, to engage pharmacists in this role? Uh, and this colleague states that uh, he or she, he's a pharmacist uh, from Libya. Uh, and, and he does encourage pharmacists to play this role, but wonders uh, about the, the need in terms of workforce capacity to, to deliver such services by pharmacists. Gilda, do you have any comments uh, in relation to that question? Why pharmacists rather than nurses? I, okay. Um, we have seen you know, that uh, the pharmacy is one of the most accessible health institutions in the community and since vaccine is also a medicine and uh, when it comes to the cold chain and the, um, you know, the storage of these drugs, you know, we can be assured that pharmacists could handle that. Now we are not competing with the doctors or the, uh, the nurses, but we are here to complement the need for uh, the vaccination of uh, the adult no? uh, in the Philippines, of adults in the Philippines. Thank you for that, Gilda. And the only point I would add to that is that uh, um, prior to pharmacists vaccinating, uh, there was a stage where nurse vaccinators were engaged in pharmacies to administer vaccines. But that was a transition to a point where pharmacists were able to be trained and administer the vaccines. Uh, Gonzo, other questions that uh, are there? Uh, yes, John. Uh, and if, if you allow me just to uh, add a point to that, it's, it's, it's not a matter of uh, pharmacists and not nurses, but it's pharmacists plus nurses plus GPs and, and really reaching out to more people rather than shifting 
uh, patients or, or individuals from one health professional to another. Uh, but also we know that, for example, primary healthcare nurses and GPs have been um, extremely burdened by, uh, by uh, the COVID-19 and, and so involving and engaging with other professions to deliver vaccination services can only uh, lead to improving vaccination coverage overall, overall in the community. Um, and we do have data that uh, nursing capacity in some parts of the world may not even be uh, sufficient, especially when we're talking about mass immunization programs for COVID-19, uh, like we are, uh, which is the likely uh, perspective that we have for the coming year. Um, Just before you go to that next question, Gonzo, I would say that the strongest argument that pharmacy has had in response to the doctor's accusation that we were encroaching on something that they have historically done, the strongest argument has been the evidence that we have increased the number of people receiving vaccines. So we increase capacity of the system. We do not compete uh, to take away the work of the doctors or the nurses for that matter. Absolutely. Yeah. In addition to that, um, we also in the Philippines, we will not just do the vaccination also without prescription from the doctor as well. So meaning there are requirements also for us to consider before we vaccinate any adult. Absolutely. And also I think we need to consider that um, a vaccination is a preventive uh, intervention. So it does not require uh, a diagnosis of an existing disease. So the, the requirement for a prescription can actually be a barrier to improving vaccination coverage. Um, so let's continue with the, with, the, with the questions on the Q&A box and, and I invite other participants to send in other, other questions. Um, we have a question from Omar Gay. Uh, thanks for the presentation and just in a few lines, what would be the strategies for advancing pharmacist vaccination in third world countries in your opinion? So how can we support uh, developing or low and middle income countries in achieving these roles? Um, Gilda, would you or Scarlett like to address that question? Oh, okay. I can, I can try. Uh, because in Hong Kong, be, um, FIP got a very good toolkit and also a lot of surveys and, and all that. Actually, um, and also a lot of links that we, we can access to. This actually gave me a lot of insight on how to approach the government and also discuss so um, this is very important because we need a lot of support, especially numbers and, and other, other countries' samples or model, you know, to show our government that this is the trend of the international arena. So I think, you know, um, in the tooth kiss, FIV tooth kiss, that should be one of the important uh, things that they should have and look at. Thank you very much for that, uh, um, Scarlett. And I appreciate you also have to leave the program very soon. So uh, if I don't get the opportunity, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Gonzo, was there a final question? I'm just watching the time. Um, no, we, that, that was the last question we, we received. Question. I'm not sure if Gilda would like to add any comments on this question. Okay. Um... Well, uh, we have, you know, uh, had a lot of challenges also pushing on this program, but still uh, I would like to, uh, you know, reiterate that we are just so thankful with FIP for the support. So it all started with uh, the FIP, uh, FIP support and giving us all these strategies on how to start with this program. And from then uh, moving forward, we're able to uh, put on our own strategies and uh, uh, consider the culture of the Philippines and also the government for our for the acceptance of pharmacies to be vaccinators. Thank you very much. And and if I may just add um, to that uh, with regards to this question from um, if I, FIP headquarters um, a perspective, let's say, or an input. Um, there's a variety of roles that pharmacists can play to drive a vaccination coverage, which is the end goal of engaging with pharmacists in vaccination. And, and it's not just about administering the vaccines, but just pharmacists becoming aware, and that's one of the goals of this program, of their important role in providing 
evidence-based advice on vaccine, addressing concerns, addressing vaccine hesitancy issues in the community. They know the community better and, and very well from the daily contact with, with uh, patients and, and individuals in general. So there's a, there's a multitude, multiple roles that they can play to, to improve vaccination coverage. And that applies to all countries, regardless of their income level as well. And so if I can just add to that, um, there is a critical point about doctors being the, uh, the key person responsible for the overall health of the, the patient. And we are not here trying to take that away from them. And uh, Scarlett made a point about uh, difficulty of accessing vaccines, which are currently prescription only in Hong Kong and wanting a rescheduling of them. There is another option that we can adopt here, and that is working in shared care arrangements with doctors, a collaborative model where the doctor still has a prescribing right. Um, but in developing countries, and that's where this question arose, uh, there's not a plethora of doctors either. And so working collaboratively with those doctors that are there through shared care arrangements, uh, pharmacists can step in with a role in administering those vaccines, or as Gonzo has said, being key people to promote and educate and maintain the supply chain of the vaccines. Um, so I think uh, we are just about there. Parisa, would you like to add any closing comments before we go to our last couple of slides? Um, I think I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank our three speakers, to thank you, John, for excellent moderation, and Gonzo for sending through those questions, um, and our audience, I guess, in terms of all the questions that they've been able to put through, and it's been a very interactive session and we've learned greatly from three countries around the work that has gone into um, allowing I guess pharmacists to vaccinate and the training that's gone in and the planning that's also set in place um, especially seeing it so nicely visually for the Philippines so thank you once again um, and nothing further to add John thank you if you feel you've learned something from tonight uh, there is a fantastic opportunity tomorrow to attend uh, the equivalent program being conducted in the, the African region. And you can see on the screen the speakers for tomorrow's event uh, that will be held in the African region. Uh, I'd also like to move on to the next slide, which I think is a very critical event for us. And that is when all of this comes together, the Global Virtual Summit, the program finale, of this fantastic program that FIP has mounted over the last few months, um, bringing up uh, so much information and focusing it uh, over the last uh, week or two at the regional level. But this will be a high level event in which we can recap the primary outcomes of the 24 event digital series. Together, uh, we will adopt the FIP commitment to action on vaccination in pharmacy, which will be uh, launched during the summit global leaders from health and pharmacy join this landmark event. So I'd like to welcome you all to participate in that. Uh, it's not at the most convenient hour of the day for us in this region, but uh, that's, uh, that's just the way it happens. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a fantastic outcome to a great program that FIP has mounted, and uh, I welcome you all to join it. So um, it uh, just leaves me to thank again uh, all of our speakers. Uh, thank the people in the FIP headquarters uh, who have done a fantastic job in mounting this. Uh, as you can see there, a recording of this will be available uh, on the FIP website. And uh, don't forget to uh, complete that poll on the COVID uh, testing and, admin and vaccination uh, in pharmacy as well. So thank you, everybody, and uh, stay well and stay safe. Good evening.